Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name's Leroy. I'm a grateful recovering alcoholic, and I'd like to thank God for giving me a chance to have a chance today. It is because of him and you people in this room I haven't found it necessary to pick up a drink or any other mind-altering substance, and for that, I'm so grateful. Um, it is great to be here. Um, my sobriety date is September 27th, 1993. I'm originally from New York City. Uh, bottom line is, uh, you know, my, uh, my alcoholism, my, uh, disease of alcoholism started very early. I probably had my, uh, first, not probably, I had my first drink, um, by happenstance, uh, when I was about probably six or seven years old, one of them deals, mom and dad had a party and they didn't clean up the glasses before they went to bed. I got up to watch cartoons and I drank everything that had something in it. (laughs) And I ended up in the hospital with alcohol poisoning. (laughs) Um, uh, but what really started happening is was, was when I started, uh, Hanging out with, uh, I always wanted to hang out with the big kids. Uh, I, I was the oldest, so I didn't have my sister or my little sister and my little brother weren't here yet. So I was like that kid that didn't have the older brother. So I had to, I had to fight everybody and fight their brothers and all of that stuff. And so, uh, I always looked to try to hang out with the older crowd, with the hip slick and cool crowd. So, you know, you had to do a lot of dares and a a lot of different things just to fit in. And I would do it, you know, whatever it took to fit in, I would do it. Uh, So eventually what that turned into was um, eventually getting to the point where, you know, I would like back then my dad was obviously smoking weed because I would find this manila, this manila little bag in the bathroom. And then I would open it up and see this stuff that looked like my mama's fertilizer that she put on her plants. And uh, I would take it down to the guys and say, hey, look what I got, you know. And then that get me a little bit more in. Or I'd see the alcohol, but the, you know, I'd see the fifth of alcohol they kept in the cabinet. And I'd, you know, take some out and put the water in there and all that neat stuff. And by the way, I would take the little marijuana bag, I would take some of my mom's fertilizer and replace it. <laughs> so I could only imagine how he was like telling his boys, look at here, have I got something for you? you know? <laughs> so uh, uh, one of the other things that began to happen is, uh, you know, my behavior in school. Uh, I was always getting in trouble. I, I got suspended every year from kindergarten I mean, I even got I even got sent home one time from kindergarten. I think it was either kindergarten or first grade because I this something didn't go my way and I threw somebody's crayons out the window. <laughs> Pretty much how it happened, and it seemed like that happened every year. So I would get in trouble for something, sit home, uh, suspended. That's that was my pattern, and uh, the teacher would always tell my mom he has no self control. That would always be on my report card. No self control. Um, so I could see now looking hindsight that, you know, that was the beginning of my disease right there. Uh, you know, and, uh, being the only child only made it worse. Uh, my sister probably came right when I was about nine years old. Um, but you know, I still primarily, you know, was, you know, getting to do my own, my own deal. Uh, one of the things that started happening is, uh, I would hang out with my, I didn't see my dad a whole lot. He worked a lot. Um, You know, he worked like two jobs. So our deal would be on Saturdays. That's when I would primarily see him. Um, So uh, I would hang out with the older guys and try to get from them, which I wasn't really getting from my dad, you know, because I really didn't get that, you know, father, son, let's hang out, spend time together. So a lot of what I learned, I learned from, you know, guys, guys in the street, you know, I stayed in some projects in New York. 
Uh, they weren't bad projects, but, you know, they were the projects. Um, eventually, uh, what ended up happening is uh, with the drinking, uh, I think my first drink that I really, really participated in purposely was when we would take and try to get a, another person to buy the alcohol for us. And uh, we had him to go buy us some <laughs> cold duck. <laughs> you know, uh, that, that was what, you know, that was our little deal, you know, drinking some cold duck. I, I, out on the benches getting drunk as, you know, here I am probably about 10, 11 years old. Uh, and that was, that was where it really began to start for me. Uh, right about at that time, um, well, also during that time, there was some times I did get to hang out with my dad, but it wasn't what I expected. I would get to hang out with him when he would go to see his girlfriend, and they would give me banana splits to keep quiet. You know, because I dug banana splits like the Carvel they was like on. So that kept me quiet for a little bit. Uh, and then later on, that down the line, that would affect me. Uh, but somehow or another, uh, the deal was supposed to be we were going to move back to North Carolina. And I'm around 12 years old at this point. We're going to move back to North Carolina. Um, and me, mom, and my little sister are going ahead and getting things ready, and dad's going to follow. And he never came. And so my resentment with my dad began then. Um, and my mom was always so, uh, uh, you know, she never divorced my dad until the day he died. But they had been separated, you know, several times over a course of 30 years. And... Um, I would always be like, he's not my dad or he don't care about us. And she would like slap me and I'd be like, what's going on? And I remember my, oh, I asked one of my uncles, why is she, you know, you know, getting on me and this guy's not even here for us. And, and I remember him saying this and, and it didn't dawn on me till later as I became an adult. He's like, you never know what goes on behind closed doors, is what he said to me. He says, your mother loves your dad very much, but you never know what goes on behind closed doors. Because in my mind, is like, this is my mom. She's a salt to the earth. How dare could he be doing this to her? And uh, so, you know, uh, we're back in North Carolina. And it just so happens that my mother had a girlfriend. They grew up together as kids. And... Um, her uh, her girlfriend's son was a few years older than me, and so I latched onto him, and he began to teach me how to drink properly. <laughs> First, by teaching me how to steal wine out of a convenience store, and so that's what we would do: we'd steal wine out of the convenience store, <laughs> you know, the whole uh, Roma Rocket MD twenty twenty. I know that might be before some of you all's time. Um, and so we would do, we would do that deal. And, uh, then it got, you know, closer to the hardest stuff, you know, so now I'm, I'm graduating to Burdett's gin and <laughs> all of this other kind of stuff, smearing off, you know, white label, all that good stuff. Uh, they're teaching me how to drink it with milk and all kinds of stuff, you know, Hey, it's going to coat your stomach. You won't have a hangover, you know, this whole deal, you know? Um, but that was the deal, you know, all about the wine tastes nasty. Yeah, well, what we're going to do is you're going to take a lemon and suck a lemon behind it, and it'll go down easy. You know, so this was my my uh, my course in drinking, and uh, that's what we did. And thank God during this period of time, I never got licensed until I was 27. So I was like your shotgun rider. So I would be the best shotgun rider you had. So, you know, hey, I'm your man. Let's I'll get in this seat, you drive. And uh, one of my friends, and he's still my friend to this day, I don't know if he's an alcoholic, um, but uh, he drinks a lot <laughs> still. Uh, but we're still, we're still decent friends. And we used to be together quite often, him, me, and the, the, uh, my mother's girlfriend's son. Um, he later passed. Um, uh, some say that it was based on an overdose. Uh, my other friend who is still living, um, you know, uh, we had been in many times where he's gotten DUIs and things like that. I mean, he used to work for Budweiser. So he drove a, 
and he and he had a special Budweiser truck he because he had the military route, and so he had a camouflage eighteen wheeler uh Budweiser truck, and it was like we would never be without beer, you know what I mean he'd be like we'd be like, we got no money, and he'd just take a case off the truck and drop it and say, damaged case if they had a damaged case, you can just drink it so <laughs> so we damaged quite a few cases uh, no pun intended. <laughs> So, uh, so we, you know, so that was the deal. That was our deal. We, you know, drinking kegs and, you know, in cases and, uh, we'd be out to the clubs just blitzed as young, you know, as young high school kids. I mean, they were more college at this point and I was in high school, but I'm still, you know, I got to hang with the older crowd. Um, eventually, you know, I start dabbing into some other things. As as one of my sponsees say, some dry goods. <laughs> so uh, so so eventually, what happens with me is that I'm still getting in trouble in school. You know, even though I'm a good athlete and all this stuff, because of you know my drinking and drugging, you know, I'm not reaching my fullest potential. Uh, and, you know, eventually I started making some bonehead decisions, one being, you know, well, I was getting scholarships offered to me to play ball to some pretty uh, prominent universities. And I was like, well, I'm not ready to do any more scholastics. And I remember telling my coaches, I'm not prepared to have people tell me what to do. So I'm going in the Navy, and they laugh at me. They, they laugh at me. I mean, one of the assistant coaches said, let me get this straight. <laughs> you don't want nobody to tell you what to do, but you're going in the Navy. <laughs> so uh, that was the deal. I went into the Navy at 17 years old. My mom had to sign off on it. And uh, what was the, even more bonehead was I did it before I graduated. I had a little situation where a teacher threatened that she wouldn't give me a credit that I needed to graduate. And uh, the principal was a close friend of the family. And so, you know, I, I could talk straight to him. So I went to him, I said, look, I'm going to graduate. And he's like, all I can tell you is to keep coming to school. I was like, am I going to graduate? He's like, all I can tell you is keep coming to school. So, you know, me being the smart ass that I was, <laughs> I decided to do delayed entry because I didn't want to be hanging around if I wasn't going to graduate. And about, and I didn't start. I didn't come to school no more. And so I remember he actually came to my house one day, and he was like, Where, "Why are you not at school?" And I was like, "You couldn't tell me if I was going to graduate, so you know, I joined the Navy." He was like, "You knucklehead!" You know, he said, "If I'd have told you that you were going to graduate, you'd have went back in that lady's class and acted like a fool." I said, "Probably." You know, uh, so I actually. Dropped out of school two weeks before graduation. Yeah, that's 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 the smart guy that I was. So I go on in the Navy, and uh, you know, it's like now I'm getting ready to graduate to the next level. You know, because drinking is encouraged to the highest level, and uh, I remember that uh, I finally got sent out on a, a, a aircraft carrier, the USS Nimitz. And it happened to be that the time that I got on there, the USS Nimitz seemed to have the highest drug and alcohol problem in the entire U.S. Navy. They were on 2020 uh, for having that problem, you know. And uh, sure enough, there was some of everything going on on the ship. You know, it's like a little city. And uh, I remember when we got over, when we got over, uh, we would be on the water. And, well, first of all, I miss ship's movement. In other words, I missed the ship. I missed the ship because the woman that I was dating at the time threw me a party. And it was a party drinking PJ. So I don't know if anybody knows what that is. Some of the older people know what it is. <laughs> but basically, it's uh, 191 proof grain alcohol. You pour it into a bucket or a cooler and you throw fruit in there and you drink it. So <laughs> that's that's the kind of party we had, and I miss the ship. So they had to fly me out to it. This is like, you know, a really big offense. And uh, even prior to that, I was uh, going to school in Virginia Beach, going to A school. And while I was going to A school, uh, 
I would be late a lot because of drinking. And uh, they, that was considered unauthorized absence, being UA. So I was UA quite a bit. And it caused me to have to go in front of the captain, captain's mass. And during this time, the Iranian hostages had just gotten released. So uh, I had to go in front of the captain, and it just so happened one of the uh, hostages that got released, they gave him his command. They gave him a command. And the command they gave him was, you know, at Virginia Beach, and I was going in front of him, you know, and uh, I went in front of him, and it was like, you know, reduction in rank, you know, 45 days extra duty, X number of fines for several months, you know, he just threw the book at me, and so then I was walking out the door, and I remember, you know, the secretary was there, and I was like, heck no, I'm not going to make him think I'm some you know, knucklehead. I'm going to go back in there and tell him what kind of sailor I really am. So I went back in, turned around and said, you know, excuse me, sir. You know, I know you think I'm a screw up, but I'm a good sailor and da, 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 da. And he's like, I respect you coming back in here and telling me that, you know, Airman Murphy. So it's not going to change my decision, <laughs> but I do respect that. <laughs> so, you know, uh, I didn't realize what kind of impact that would have later because, I had to have what we call a welcome aboard speech before going on the, uh, before being accepted, uh, you know, to the, uh, my new duty. And so there was five of us and he gives us this welcome aboard speech, what to expect and all this stuff. This is the executive officer. And then he says, okay, you all can go now. And he says, Murphy, you stay. And I'm like, okay, what did I do? I just got here, right? So then he says, listen. I just want you to know I got a great report from Commander Sherry. You know, he says he thinks you're going to be an excellent sailor. And, you know, if there's ever any trouble, you know, hopefully you can just come to me and we can make sure everything's okay. You know, he's like, let me know, you know, you got a pass here, buddy. You know, and, uh, you know, sure enough, when I got, you know, when I missed the ship, you know, here's my first test. <laughs> and not only... Am I now, you know, going in, you know, I, I just went in front of this guy that got really, you know, uh, released from being a hostage. Now, the squadron that I'm going to happens to be the guy that shot down two of Gaddafi's mids, uh, mix. So he's gun ho because he just shot down, you know, two of Gaddafi's mix. He done shot down planes. He's like, this is going to be a top notch squadron. So I'm going in front of him. So I get the same deal. He throws the book at me. Right. And so I'm holding my head down like my life is over. And, you know, the executive officer said, what are you doing? Hold, hold your head up. I'm like, did you hear that? I didn't hear the part that says suspend it. And I didn't even know what that meant. He says, as long as you don't get in no trouble, you'll be fine. I mean, I just had to serve my 45 days extra duty. And so, you know, that's what I did. Uh, but eventually I started getting off the ship and, you know, and uh, it was just the drinking just escalated. People had alcohol on the ship. I remember when we got off this, you know, because you're on the water 30 days, 40 days at a time. So when we get off, it's like it's on and popping because we're only going to get off maybe one day, possibly two. We're going to make it count. Right. And uh, I remember one time he says, whatever you do, don't drink the ouzo. Well, guess what I'm going to do when I can <laughs> What's the ouzo? And it was this opium-based liquor. And I was like, we got to get some. And, you know, the alcoholic just came out of me because we're going there and we're going to. And then we're about to all order us a shot. And I say, check this out. How much for the bottle? You know what I mean? You know, let's cut through all of this, you know. so. And then um, I remember we went, um, we could get the alcohol cheap at the uh, PX. So there was about 20 of us. The alcoholic mind, here we go. Why don't we all each buy a different alcohol and drink it all together? And everybody said, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we had this picnic table with everybody, all this different alcohol, and we're drinking it all. Nobody's, like, sticking to, like, if you start with this, you continue to drink. Mm -mm. We were drinking everything, and we got drunk till we could get drunk no more. And I remember when we would get off the ship, I, the first time I got off the ship, when we would get a, you know, come across shore, they would put us in these little small boats, you know, to come across shore. And then when we see you have these things that look like chicken wire money cages. And I'd be like, what are those? And then one of the guys says, wait till we come back tonight. 
And when we came back, I would see these guys who were trying to jump in the water and swim like 50 miles back to the ship, you know, and, you know, so they would lock them up in these uh, chicken wire mummy cages. And then that's how they had to take them back to the ship, you know, because they were, they was like out of control. So I was like, okay, so that's what those cages are for, <laughs> you know, so it, 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 it was, it was crazy. So um, that was, so I was out on the water with this kind of behavior for nine months. Uh, needless to say, being on the water was uh, not, it didn't go well with me. And I would get very depressed. And they would have this other stuff on there, this this stuff called hash. And they would, you know, and I would be smoking that. And whenever, you know, because couldn't get no alcohol while we were really on the ship, not every once in a blue moon. And it would, and I would get depressed. And they would, you know, I would listen to music and be depressed. And they would be like, Murph, you got to snap out of that, you know, because I would just be listening to love songs and, you know, and, you know, and it's just, it, I would just be done. Uh, so the first opportunity they gave me to get out, I took it. Uh, they gave me, because I would cause a lot of paperwork. I would do different stuff that caused, a, you know, my discharge says convenience of the Navy. Okay, um, and I remember him telling me. He says, uh, "He says, look, he says, you know, these people are gonna, you know, they're gonna be after you, and they're gonna lower your evaluations until they can kick you out on a dishonorable." So he said, "I can give you a discharge now, general and honorable conditions. You're gonna get all your benefits, you know." And uh, I'm like you know, talking to him like I'm some free agent, you know, for the NBA or NFL. <laughs> Give me a day to kind of think about this. <laughs> and I came back the next day and said, I'll take it. <laughs> uh, you know, so, I, you know, so I, I, I did every bit of 18 months total um, and uh, got on out. And uh, when I got out, I ended up coming back to New York and uh, now there's this opportunity for me to stay with my dad and the possibility of some sense of, I guess, reconciliation. I don't know. But uh, there's this opportunity for me to come back to New York and stay with him and uh, go up there. And, you know, I mean, he's living his life. You know what I mean? Uh, here I come, you know, uh, and I'm kind of cramping his style. You know what I mean? You know, because he's, you know, he's dating women and doing his thing, you know. And, uh I don't, you know, I, I still had the little resentment piece and uh, I think I kind of carried it around on my shoulder a little bit. And I remember he had a roommate and, you know, they were doing their things as bachelors. And um, I got upset with, you know, because I think the roommate had one of his, my dad had a house in New York and then it had a downstairs apartment. And I didn't particularly like the fact that he had the downstairs apartment. So um, I decided that I was going to beat him up one day. And uh, and then I told him and I and I and I guess I must have said somewhere along the lines and you know I'd kick my dad's ass too, and so I remember the next day my dad was walking around in his boxers he had a, he had his boxers on and his slippers no shirt and he had a gun on his waist. <laughs> You know, and I would call my mom like, Dad's around here with a pistol on his hip, you know, and whatever. So, uh, you know, we, we just never really got on the same page. Uh, eventually, uh, you know, this other epi uh, epidemic hit. Uh, you know, unfortunately, you know, I believe in keeping the singleness of purpose, but my story does have some mind-altering substances in it. And uh, that was just hitting the scene, you know, uh, you know, this big drug, you know, and uh, and I got wide open with it. And uh, in the midst of that, I ended up uh, meeting my ex-wife, you know, and it was like, you know, uh, wine song, rock and roll that, you know, that's what it was all about. The, the whole relationship was based on, you know, sex and drugs, pretty much. And. Um, that's just what happened. We just got lost in that. Uh, along the way, uh, we began to have children. Um, we ended up, we ended up eventually moving here to Atlanta. Um, and uh, I ended up getting here to Atlanta because uh, I had gone back to North Carolina for a while, and then she had followed. 
And when I was in North Carolina, um, I got back with my friends that are the drinkers, and I was always the one that went a little step further with some of the other mind-altering substances. But uh, I had gotten back with them, and this one night we were in a bootleg spot. We ho- always hung in a, in Wilmington, North Carolina, there's a lot of bootleg spots. Af- that's our after-hour spots. <laughs> and um, there was this guy from, that was this guy from Atlanta who was, what I'd come to find out later, was this telemarketing kingpin. And, um, you know, and he had this condo, he's given all the drinks, and he's given all the drugs, and, you know, and he's like, oh, man, what are you, and at the time, I was like, you know, doing a little work, you know, construction work or whatever, and so, you know, he's like, you know, uh, this grandiose behavior that we do, and he's like, oh, man, he's like, so what do you do, man? And I was like, you know, I said, I'm doing a little construction work. Oh, you got that gift of gab. He said, I got guys in Atlanta making two, three thousand dollars a week talking like you talk, you know. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's just keep doing your stuff. Cause, you know, more drinks, more drugs. Let's do that. And so uh, he gave me this proposal. He said, I tell you what, he said, I'm so confident that you could do this. He said, I'll fly you there. And he said, if you can't do it, I'll fly you back. And, uh, Sure enough, he had a ticket for me. You know, a couple of days later, I flew down to Atlanta, and uh, I went. So what I came to find later, he had this boiler room. And so I went in there, and I'm listening to these guys, and basically what they're doing is they're lying over the phone. You know, and I figure I lied pretty good. And so I listened to what they did. And uh, my first week, I made $1,500. That was in 1989, and I've never left since. <laughs> uh, and that's, that began my career, you know, as a crooked telemarketer. Uh, I pretty much just robbed people over the phone. That's what, that's what I did. Um, not something I'm proud of today, uh, but at the time, it was like the ultimate enabler. You know, to make several thousand dollars a week, because I thought in New York that was my bottom. And let me backtrack a little bit, because when I was in New York, uh, there was a period of time where I ended up becoming, you know, after that deal with, uh, after I beat up my dad's roommate, I got kicked out of his home. And then I was homeless for a while. And in fact, when he kicked me out, uh, when, when we were kids, there was a next door neighbor. She was my god sister. And we grew up, you know, since we were, you know, when I first moved to those projects, we grew up together, went to school together. So just so happened, and I know this is not by happenstance, this is where I know where truly uh, uh, God was always uh, there, even in my drinking and using, he was always there. And uh, just so happened that she was now in recovery, and her mother was staying one block from my dad in New York. And he was like, you might need to go down there and talk to, you know, Deidre or talk to her mom or whatever. And then she came and got me and she took me from my to my first meeting in New York uh, to a place. Uh, 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 I forget, it, but it's on it's St. Mark's, uh, you know, well-known club. I don't even think it's there anymore, but it would be like a 24-7 AA clubhouse. And uh, they would get you three hots and a cot and a whole nine. And she took me there and they took me in and. Uh, I ended up getting a job on Times Square McDonald's that's open 24 hours a day, you know, 24 hours a day. Uh, I worked there like for a week until I got my first check and then I was gone. Right. Recovery wasn't in the picture, but she was my first. That was my first exposure. She took me to a meeting where she it was her birthday. And I got to see them doing okay, but I was so out of it and zoned out. I didn't really get it at that point. Uh, so now I'm just doing the homeless deal. And I end up getting uh, caught up uh, in one of these shelters that's a veteran shelter. Since I'm a vet, I get uh, into this veteran shelter, and it's kind of new and one of its kind. And so that kind of got me off the street. And then also what ended up happening is uh, I was able to get a vending license. Uh, The veterans could get a vending license very quickly, but everyone else would have to wait on a waiting list. So what you would have is you would have a lot of, you know, a lot of the immigrants that did the street vending, they would hire you for your license and pay you a certain percentage of what you sold. 
So what basically happened is selling knockoff stuff. Now they're doing their New York, I love New York and New York, New York shirts. But then, you know, you got like the Heart Rock Cafe over there and they're selling their shirts for 11. We sell them for five. Then you got Chanel number five selling their shirts for, you know, 50. We sell them for five. Gucci shirts, 50. We sell them for five. So that's what, that's what I was doing. I was selling these shirts. And because I was a veteran, what would happen is they hired you mainly because, number one, if they did it, they go to jail and they lose their merchandise. But as a veteran, I would, they would just take the stuff to jail and then I could go back and get the stuff, you know, and, you know, you continue on with business. And they pay you 20% of whatever you sell. So we would sell about $1,000 a day, easy. And they would pay me $200. So... Every day, I'd be making like $200, and i get completely zoned out of my mind off 200 bucks in New York. 200 bucks back then in New York went a long way for partying. And then the first thing they do when I show up is give me $5 to go eat breakfast. You know? <laughs> No-brainer, right? <laughs> so I'm just getting, I'm so, so, you know, getting high. I mean, I did this for a year where I got high every single day. So... It got to a point where it was kind of getting, you know, it was kind of getting to me. I was, get, I was getting to that bottom, so I thought. And I was like, I, you know, I, I said, I got to get some help. And so the guy was telling me about this treatment center in Northport, Long Island. And they said, you go there, man, and, you know, you know they'll take you in, your vet, they ain't going to cost you nothing. So I get on out there, and, so I call them, and they say, well, look, the only requirement is you got to be clean, for 24 hours, 40 hours before you come here. I said, okay, so now I'm, you know, now I'm trying to drink Golden Seal and all of this little stuff, right? But it don't work because I'm getting hot <laughs> while I'm drinking it. <laughs> so I go out there, and I think I done drink all this stuff, and it's cleaned my system. And they let me in, and, you know, and I sleep for about a day, and they feed me, and then we're going to the group. And so... uh they're asking different questions, and they're like, oh. I was like, well, yeah, I probably wasn't clean. It was like, we knew that. It was like, your numbers were off the chart when you came in here, you know. <laughs> and so what happened was they said, uh, well, tell us, you know, what you were supposed to do is tell them how bad it was, you know, and this was supposed to be a testament to the other people there, other patients, of how bad it is to be out there, you know, drinking and using. So they asked me to tell what was going on. I said, okay, here's the deal. I work for these people. They pay me $200 a day. I said, at times, I got about $1,000 in my hand until they pick me up. When they pick me up, I give them the 1000 They give me the 200 We go. I come back. We do it again. So one of the guys said, so you never stole all the money? I said, no. Why would I do that? I said, he's paying me $200 a day. I can get, I can get blasted all day for 200 bucks." And so <laughs> later on, the director came and said, look, we're going to have to let you go. I said, let me go. They said, you really don't have a problem. I said, yeah, I do. <laughs> and they said, nah, you don't have a problem, you know, because I didn't steal the money, all the money. You know, they, they said, you seem to be a functioning alcoholic and addict. I was like, do not send me back out there. <laughs> right? So they kicked me out. They kicked me out the treatment center. You know, so I was back out there, and I called uh, you, the guys to come pick me up, and they picked me up, and that was the deal. And eventually it got so bad because these guys I was working for were some of, some of the same guys that we're probably reading about, you know, overseas now that are fighting. You know, they were from, like, militia and different things like that. And I remember I got on their nerves so bad one time this guy did this little move where he almost was, like, going to choke me out. And I just looked at him like, do what you got to do, you know? And I was, and I guess he saw it, and he was like, what's wrong with you? And I was like, I just want to go home. And he said, you want to go home for real? And he took me to the bus station, saw me off, and then I had given him my mom's number, and then he called to make sure I got there. So then when I got back to North Carolina, that's where the story begins with, you know, meeting the guy, the telemarketing kingpin. So I get here to Atlanta, and I remember one of the first things that, um, one of the first things that he did, you know, because, you know, he wants to show me how much of a big shot he is and, you know, pump me up to be this good salesperson and make money. Yeah. 
So he takes me, he says, so do you like Janet Jackson? I say, sure. So he takes me to a Janet Jackson concert at the Omni. So I remember when we go, you know, it was, you know, during intermission, they have the bars out there where you can get your drinks. So, so the, uh, so they're asking, so they, you know, they're about to give me a drink and one of these little clear cups, you know, with a shot or two in it. And I said, "Mm -mm." I said, you know, they also had the daisy cups for sodas. I said, you see that daisy cup over there? I said, get that. And I said, what I need you to do is I need you to fill that up and then put a little ice in it. So the guy, this telemarketing kingpin, right, he says, you know something? You're an alcoholic. (laughs) And here's my response. Yeah, you're right. (laughs) You know, and, and, and that's my deal. My deal throughout this whole thing is I never was confused about being an alcoholic. I, I was clear. You know, I was clear that I could not stop. Something was going to have to stop me. I'm the one they talk about in the book where it took the act of providence. That's me. I wasn't going to stop myself. And what eventually started happening was started going to jail. You know, I started being in the wrong places, doing the wrong things, and it was picking me up. See, once you start getting picked up by the red dog, it's all downhill from there. (laughs) And that's what started happening. I started getting picked up because I was soliciting in the wrong places and getting locked up uh, quite a bit. And it was right around this last stint that I got locked up. The first time they locked me up, they let me go on my own reconnaissance, whatever they call it. Then after that, I get locked up again. And then this time, they're like, okay, look. Now, I get locked up, and he lets me out, and I'm supposed to be on probation. And I'm supposed to show up clean. But I keep showing up dirty at the probation office. And she's pissed, but I could like, I got my fine money, because I'm still doing telemarketing. And she's pissed that I can come in with this money, but yet, I'm never clean. So then finally... Um, I end up, uh, she ends up, you know, this one time I say, well, I've been missing like for two weeks. No, no, that didn't happen yet. I end up going to jail one time and then the judge says, well, I want you on this monitor where what it is is that it hooks up to your phone and has a breathalyzer to it and it also takes your picture. So when they call, you got to run to the phone. You got to do a voice check. This is Leroy Murphy. Then you got to put your mouth on the breathalyzer, blow in it, hit a button that takes your picture to make sure it's you that's blowing in it. And so you got to do that every time they call. Did good for a couple of days. (laughs) (laughs) Then I had this keen idea. You know what? I'm going to get me some, um, what do they call it? Uh, Well, we called it near beer or, you know, non-alcoholic beer. Yeah, old duels, yeah. Well, that non-alcoholic beer is for non-alcoholics, and that wasn't me. So I said I'd buy a case of it and drink the case of it, because, of course, it has 0.5% alcohol in every can. So if you drink about 12 or 24, chances are you're going to blow something. So at that point, I didn't go back to the uh, little apparatus anymore, and I just, I just went off to the races. I did a everything must go sail in my home. Uh, you know, it just so happened that uh, my ex-wife and my uh, son who was just born were visiting in New York, so they had no home to come back to. Uh, And then um, I'd been missing for two weeks, so I finally called a probation officer, and I was like, well, I was like, uh," she says, Leroy, where you been? I said, "Uh, you know, here, there, to and fro. (laughs) She said, well, did you use? I was like, kind of, sort of. She's like, no problem. Come on in. <laughs> and I thought I was being so slick and smart. I, I, you know, I had money, so I caught a cab all the way downtown and got there. And there was probably a room full of people, as many of these chairs in there. And I, I've been on this two-week binge, so I'm sleepy. I nod off and wake up, a little thinner. Nod off, wake up, a little thinner. Then I see her walking. She says, hi, Leroy. You know, and then I nod off, and then the next time I woke up, it was just me in there. I said, okay, nod back off, and then the next time when I'm waking up, I see this, you know, silhouette walking toward me, and it's her, and it's somebody else, 
And the next thing I hear, Leroy Murphy, we got a warrant for your arrest. And they, you know, I'm like, come on. I'm like, my family needs me. And she's like, nope, told you not to use Leroy. And she just drove, they drove me straight to Rice Street. That was the, you know, rude awakening for me. Because now, you know, this is where I was in there for about three or four weeks. All before it was just, you know, a few days here or a week there. But this was like like a full month, month and a half. So I'm in there with these cats and they're saying, ah, oh, you know, man, I know how I got in here. If I hadn't have been messing with this female, you know what I mean? I wouldn't have got locked up. So when I go back out there next time, I'm going to do this. So I'm listening to them and I'm like, so that, wait a minute. They just got locked up. And they talking about how they're going to go back out here and try this again. I said, that's crazy. And I said, I'm in here with them, so that makes me crazy. Um, so just what happened, because the, the, the telemarketing kingpin piece, you know, it's pretty similar to, you know, you know kind of being a prostitute. You know what I mean? It's like, you know, you're out there working and, you know, you get locked up. He's losing money, so he needs to get you out for you to go ahead and make him some more money. <laughs> And that's what he did. He was like, you know, I'm going to get you the best lawyer. Got to get you out. Da 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 da. So he gets me this lawyer, and the lawyer says, "Look, I'm going to give you this. Uh, you know, this they're going to going to have to take this test. It's going to take you about three or four hours, but you got to answer it like you're just the worst alcoholic there is. You know, and I mean, you know, it only took me about an hour, hour and a half to fill it out. You know, and uh, you know, I go in front of the judge, and the judge was like, nah. You know, we've been through this with you too many times. You know what we want? We want to. We want you to stay in jail until an opening comes in Mar. But there's a six month waiting list, and I'm like, six month waiting list? I got to sit in jail for six months to wait to go into treatment? I was like, it ain't gonna work. You know, so I asked the attorney to get me back in front of the judge, and you know, uh, during that period of time, I'm asking him to get me back in front of the judge. You know, I'm reading the Bible. I'm doing my foxhole prayers like I've done so many times before. And, uh, you know, so we go back in front of the judge with the same proposal that he turned down the first time, but this time he says yes. So they let me out to go to this treatment center. So when I get out, I'm supposed to go straight to the treatment center, to the halfway house, okay? Uh, and so I'm over there by Bankhead. So when I get out of jail, I'm doing good. You gotta go over here and get me a couple of new ports. Now I'm gonna get on the train. But uh you know, and I and I don't even get no, I don't get nothing to drink. I just get the cigarettes, get on the train, I get all the way back over here to Briarcliff and North Dude Hills where I live. And what it is is that my ex wife's cousins who we used with, I need to let them know that I'm out. So I tip but I'm not gonna get out the cab. I'm just gonna have the cab roll by. And so I roll by in the parking lot and I have a beef the horn. I'd be like, hey, y'all, I'm out. Now, here's where I get the first uh, sense of um, the, uh, 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 the phenomenon of craving. And even prior to that, the obsession. OK, you know, that obsession kicked in the moment I said, hi, I'm out. And I saw them as we were driving away. All I was doing was thinking about how I've used and drank with them. And by the time I got home, it really was kicking in. And, you know, I was like, call them, come get me. Sure enough, they came and got me, and I did what I do. And now, once again, because I've done it before in New York, I used to, after I've been on a binge and did it once again, I want to kill myself. I want to jump off the, you know, subway platform, but I ain't got the guts to do it. Now I'm walking around Atlanta figuring out, like, how can I kill myself? You know, not going to do it. Um, and then finally, I decided to show up at the uh, treatment center, and they have the group, okay, Leroy, where you been? Ah, uh, you know, I was locked up. I had to go see a lady, da 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 you know, another lie. And so one of the guys said, so, he said, so you were locked up, you went to see a lady, but you didn't use? I was like, nah. He said, I would have, you know. So eventually I'm sitting there and they're doing their group and I'm feeling guilty. So I'm like, hey, I use. And they're like, hey, we know. And, <laughs> you know. And uh, the director said, well, look, the judge told me that if Leroy messed up once, that I was supposed to bring him back. Now 
here's my little spiritual awakening of the educational variety. I don't want to go back to jail. And he's talking about sending me back to jail. And I'm like, please don't do this. And uh, I remember one of the, you know, I figured, you know, he left it up to the group, like, you know, I'm going to leave it up to the group. What should we do with Leroy? So I don't think they're going to throw me to the wolves. I'm like, they're like me. And the first guy says, screw him. If he ain't serious about his recovery, send his behind back. And now I'm like very fearful. And then there was this guy who was the house manager who I ended up becoming very close with later. He said, well, look, I think we should give him a chance and at least give him an opportunity to see if he's serious about recovery. And me and him ended up latching on because at that moment when they let me back in, I was like, look, I don't want to go back to jail, so I'm willing to do whatever we got to do. And me and this guy really, you know, like we would go back to the halfway house because this was outpatient. So I would still go to work at the telemarketing place and still come to this outpatient treatment center. And they would have like, you know, the group, they would have a meeting and they would, they would have a class and then a meeting. And uh, one of the first things they did, he was like, there would be a different meeting each day. Like it might be an, out, an AA meeting, an NA meeting and a CA meeting. So he gave us this little scenario. He said, now look, you can go to any of these programs. <laughs> he said AA is the original one and it has, you know, a longer period of time of being around and it has a higher percentage of people that, you know, are recovering. So he said, if you're a betting man, you know, so that's how I chose to come to AA, even though I was dealing with some other mind altering substances. And so that was my deal. Um, then me and this guy every night when we came home to the halfway house after our sessions, me and him would sit up and eat our dinner and talk for like hours. I didn't know what that was doing at the time. Now, everybody else in that apartment used except me and him. And that's when I got to see what the therapeutic value of one alcoholic sharing with another was all about. And so we locked in on that. Um, you know, eventually I ended up getting ready to, I was getting ready to be released. And there was some fear, but something told me before I was going to go to this aftercare, where I was going to do the aftercare once a week. Instead of what I was doing every day, we we're going to be doing this aftercare once a week. And they have been making us go to mandatory meetings, which one of them was the men's meeting at Triangle at 9 o'clock in the morning on Saturdays. And that's how I met my friend, dear Smitty, over there. And uh, there was another Sunday morning meeting that they made me go to at Clarkston. So I started making the Triangle Clubhouse like... That's going to be, you know, where I do all my meetings, you know, and I started going to meetings every day after work so that I would like be able to have a transition because I didn't want that culture shock of I had the protection of the treatment center. To this day, I tell people the greatest time in my recovery was while I was in the halfway house <laughs> because all I had to do was what people told me. They had me in a safe environment. I didn't really have to worry about working. All I had to do was do what they said do, you know. Then I get, you know, I mess around and work some steps and practice some principles. Now I got to go out here and be a productive member of society. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? The game changes, okay? You know, so, uh, you know, that was the deal, you know. We, you know, I'm going to these meetings. I finally tap in, listening to some people. I listen to this guy in the men's room, and he, um, he's sharing. Because at first, when I get, you know, to my first meeting at Triangle, you know, I'm saying, ah, oh, these guys are a bunch of squares. They don't know nothing about getting down like I get down, you know. And then this guy shares one day, and he shares like the book talks about with some depth and weight about how he was out there drinking and using. And I felt it. I was like, he knows. But then he came behind it and said, but today I got peace. And that's something I hadn't had in a long time. And I wanted some peace. He got me with that. I wanted some peace. So uh, at that moment, one of the, being a con man like I was, I knew that this program wouldn't work if I listened to Leroy anymore. And I said, you can no longer listen to you. And at that point, that's when I decided to do whatever people told me to do. On top of which, the guy at the halfway house one time, I was trying to be real slick and take some girl out behind the treatment center's back, you know? And I told him, I said, look, it's going to be okay because 
I'm going to um, stay in this hotel with her, but I'm going to take my big book with <laughs> And he said, I hope that works out for you. But he ended up saying something that really, really stopped me in my tracks. He said, he said, I hope that works out for you, right? And that's all I could remember him talking about. He hoped that worked out for me. And then um, I didn't do it. I ended up taking the guy I was working for, the kingpin. I took him to the concert. <laughs> And uh, I told him, I came the next day and I told him, he said, I'm glad you did that. He said, look, you've tried this thing your way and it's never worked. He said, for once, try it someone else's way. And if you don't like it, we'll gladly refund you your misery back. What a concept. He had me. I'm like, that's a good deal. I'm down with that. And so that's what I did, whatever people told me. And uh, I ended up getting, uh, ended up getting a sponsor. And uh, the sponsor, I told him, like, hey, what's the deal? Like, you know, what's up with these steps? When do I start working the steps? He said, how soon do you want to get well? We got to it, you know. Um, you know, uh, I got to that fourth step, and I procrastinated a little bit. But when I actually got into it and got to the part about my dad, that's where I saw how the fourth step really worked in my life because I had such a resentment against him. And when I worked that fourth step the way it is in the big book, you know, it was revealed to me. My dad was doing the very best he could, and I don't know how he was raised. I don't know how he came up. I don't know how his dad was. You know what I mean? And I had done screwed up a few relationships myself at that point, so how could I dare be pointing the finger, you know? And I was able to go ahead and release some things with him, you know? Um, and I just went down the list, and, 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 and that worked for me. Uh, eventually I ended up being able to do the fifth step, you know, the big boogeyman. Oh, I couldn't possibly tell him this. And we've all heard the stories. As soon as I put mine out there, he puts, he said, let me do you one better. Bam. You know what I mean? So my stuff wasn't that big anymore. Uh, you know, you know, being able to, uh, deal with those defects, you know, uh, you know, being able to be a big boy about it, like, okay, you know, you know. And when they said, I didn't have to say, as long as I said, no, never. As long as I wasn't saying, no, never, I cannot give this up. You know, I had a shot. It was okay to have some stuff still lingering as long as I just be willing. And it took me a long time to understand I just had to be willing. Um, what really started, you know, doing the amends piece, I made some mistakes there, you know, especially when it came to making amends to, you know, females in my life, you know. You know, don't do that alone at home. You know what I mean? Uh, you know, that doesn't work real well. You know, uh, next thing you know, you're back in a relationship again, you know, because you're going to make a money amends. And then some other stuff, you get Google eyes. And the next thing you know, you know, you just started something over again, you know, and then you start harming somebody again, you know. <laughs> so now you're doing that. It's back to your fourth step again. So that wasn't good. Uh, but eventually what ended up happening when I uh, eventually started working through those steps and what I didn't realize was happening was my relationship with God was building up stronger. You know, I had been brought up in the church, you know, and, you know, and I knew of God, but I just didn't know how to use him effectively. But now, you know, after doing the foxhole prayers and dealing with my parents, God and my grandparents, God, now. I had a relationship of God on my own and a testimony of how he was working in my life. You know, I had evidence. So now I was able to be like, okay, now I know how this God thing works for me. Um, and so that just got stronger and stronger and it allowed me to move into another area of my life where I depended more on God. Uh, and matter of fact, it, it tells me in the fourth step and I know I'm getting to the point where I got to close, but one part in the big book, and it's one of my favorite parts when it talks about this, about dependence on God. Um, when it says right here, for we are now on a different basis, the basis of trusting and relying upon God. We trust an infinite God rather than finite selves. We are in a world to play the role he assigns just to the extent that we do, that we do as we think he would have us and humbly rely on him. Does this does does he enable us to match calamity with serenity? So by working the steps, it got me to a point where I was starting to be given some principles 
where when trouble came, because it wasn't a matter of if, when trouble came, I had something to work with. And so some things started happening, you know, um, you know, I, I lost the marriage. Uh, I had a business. I lost the business. I became a single dad. You know what I mean? Totally unprepared for it. Um, I ended up uh, losing functioning of my kidneys. And then I was on dialysis for three and a half years. Uh, I ended up losing my youngest child in a car accident at nine years old. Um, then I ended up getting a transplant right after that. Um, so a lot of different things, a lot of trials and tribulations along the way, but no way I could, you know, move through that number one without having a home group and allowing people to know me. Okay. Participating in things like the rock and my home group so that when I'm going through some stuff, some people can hold me up. They can hold me accountable. You know what I mean? And help guide me along the way. That's how I got through that stuff. It wasn't, you know, of me. And I know that was God working through people. OK, that's where that full dependence on God. I had to trust him and trust you all because I knew that he brought me here to this program. OK, and now I oh, I got to give back to this program. OK, we already know how that works. You know, so that's what I started doing. And one of the things when I got to the 12th step, you know, a lot of times, you know, many of us, at least I did, you know, I always focused on the being of service part of it. Not so much practicing the principles in all my affairs. But one of the things that I did early on is um, I was given a daily reflection. And every morning I would wake up before everybody else in the halfway house and read the daily reflection. And it would usually take, you know, it ends up being more or less like a little mini meeting. It'll, it'll take you to a particular piece of literature, particular page, and it starts a topic. So one day it started this topic, I believe, on emotional sobriety. And it was on the 12th step. And I ended up, from that little excerpt, I ended up reading the entire 12th step and receiving it in a whole new way because it brought to mind all the things I was now going to deal with. See, now I realized that now they're saying, look here, you've got all the tools. Now you got to go out here and you're going to have to do life. Besides helping people, you're going to have to do life, live life on life's terms. So... Utilize these tools to do so. And uh, I have a whole new light and respect for the 12th step, you know, um, in regards to what that's all about. Uh, bottom line is uh, this took me to a point to where I got closer and closer with God. Uh, it allowed me to become an ordained minister. That's what I am now. Um, that's the furthest thing that was from my mind, but that's where God led me. Okay. Um, and, uh, and I'm happy that he's, that he's using me that way. You know, I'm happy to be of service in that way. So, you know, I know that I'm still having, I need to be connected here with you all. I'm clear. Okay. And at the same time, he has some other work he has me doing, you know, outside of here into another area. But the wonderful point of the wonderful thing about it is I find no conflict with the two. Today, I can take church and I can take the program and I realize they're two different things, but they work together, you know, and that's a wonderful thing. Because one of the things I do see in the church is, you know, they have the same sicknesses we have. They have the same issues we have. But the one thing they don't have is that honesty, that capacity to be honest, like walk through the door and be like, hey, I'm broken and jacked up. You know, we come in the door and if you don't say it, we know it. we'd be like, you're broke. We'd be like, you're broken and jacked up just like me. So don't come out here with no mess, man. You know what I mean? And, and church is totally different, you know. So God's led me to, you know, to go into counseling, you know, and hopefully be able to help some people with that, you know, and, and, and bring some people together on that. But listen, this this recovery life has been awesome. OK, uh, there's no way in the world I would be alive here without it. There's no way in the world I would have gotten through any of my issues without it. Uh, you know, and I'm going to always be a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, I'm glad to be a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I'm glad that you all are in my life. And I'm so glad you all allowed me to come here and share with you tonight. Thanks.
Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.